I am the Solomon Monster, and this is episode 34 of RSPW Rewind. Glad to be back with you. I know it's been a while. It's been a hot minute since I've done the last one. I've been getting a lot of messages. When's the next one coming out? When's the next RSPW Rewind coming out? I'm just glad there's still a demand for it. I'm glad you guys enjoy it. So here we are, episode 34, the final RSPW of the year. This will be the last one of 2020, where we look back at all the dumb stuff, and maybe not so dumb stuff, but let's be honest, it's mostly dumb stuff that the wrestling community was talking about on the internet many years ago. There are a few places scarier than the RSPW news group, which has its own entry, and I did not know this until this week, but RSPW has its own entry in the Urban Dictionary which I will read to you right now. RSPW is defined as a Usenet group filled with insane, hostile trolls. So basically, Facebook, Twitter, and YouTube comments before any of those things even existed. That is what RSPW is. So for those who don't know how this works, uh, people have been posting on RSPW going back to the I say early 90s, but I think RSPW actually came about in 1989. So it's a very old internet forum, still exists today. I don't know how, you know, how, how uh, active it is as compared to many years ago. But I dig up old posts to not only see what people were talking about at that time during that particular uh, period in history, but also just to illustrate that wrestling fans have always been out of their minds. Wrestling fans have always been complaining about this and that and everything in between. This is not some kind of new phenomenon just because now you have social media. This was the original social media. And this sort of thing has been going on for a very long time. This is hardly some new phenomenon. So with that out of the way, let us get to a nice little medley of posts that I put together for you here this week. We begin with a post by somebody with the longest username that I have ever seen in my life. The Power Geeking, Burger Flipping, Spider Worshipping, Softball Playing, Warlock. <laughs> On September 13th, 1992 with a post titled, PWI Top 500. The December issue of Pro Wrestling Illustrated has the second annual Top 500 North American Wrestlers listing. And in fact, 1991 was the first year that there was a PWI 500, that is correct. So this was only the second time that they put the list out. That's how far back this goes. Anyway, he, uh, the Warlock, Continue says I really did not feel like typing the entire list, but here is the top 100 and some other miscellaneous suggestions or uh, selections rather He says it's a laugher and You see the top 10 which is in order from number one all the way to number 10 sting Ranked at number one very appropriate as I am recording this Sting just made his big return to wrestling, he debuted in AEW at the age of 61. And here in 1992, Sting was ranked number one in the PWI 500, followed by Randy Savage, Ric Flair, Rick Rude, Bret Hart at number five, Rick Steamboat, Jerry Lawler, Scott Steiner, Ultimate Warrior, and Steve Austin. Some other highlights, number 12, Hulk Hogan, Number 16, Shawn Michaels. Number 100 that year was Mike Graham. Mike Graham, who will forever own one of the greatest quotes in wrestling history when he talked about Jeff Jarrett. Never drew a dime, broke 6,000 guitars, never drew a dime. Number 454 in the top 500 was Dwayne Gill. Gilbert. Came in at number 454. 491 was Andre the Giant. So Gilbert beat Andre. That's how bad off Andre was there by the end. This was the year before Andre passed away. He was number 491. And 
finishing out the top 500 was Morgus the Maniac. I don't know too much about Morgus the Maniac. In fact, I don't know a goddamn thing about Morgus the Maniac. It's the first I'm hearing of him. But in 1992, he cracked the top 500. So he can put that on his resume. Nobody could ever take that away from him. Brent Sutherland says, What kind of drugs is Bill Apter dishing out at PWI? Number 62, Ricky Choshu. Number 109, Janichiro Tenru. Number 114, Barry Horowitz. Number 157, Hiroshi Hase. Number 209, Masa Chono. Are they mad that Japanese cars are selling so good? Or do they just have a natural hatred for Japanese wrestlers? And Barry Horowitz, 114, better than Hase and Chono. Sure, let's be more serious, PWI. Michael Jenkinson says that, and why is Kurt Hennig rated at all? The man has not wrestled in over a year. I don't have the issue yet. Do they give an explanation as to why someone who has been inactive for 13 months deserves a ranking at all? It was like the inaugural PWI 500 where they rated Savage 3 or 4, yet he had not wrestled in 7 months at that point because he lost his retirement match at WrestleMania 7. Totally bogus, even for PWI. By the way, has anyone noticed how the same group that publishes PWI also publishes WCW Magazine? Good grief, can you say conflict of interest? He's uh, teeing up a conspiracy theory. He's saying the fix is in when it comes to these rankings. Maybe that's why Sting was number one that year. Next up, is a post one month later from Oliver Postlethwaite. That is his name, Oliver Postlethwaite, in the evening of October 9th, 1992, titled simply Intercontinental Champion. While trying to fall asleep last night, I started thinking about the WWF Intercontinental title because who among us does not think of such things when they're dozing off at night? Me personally, I usually have on Monday Night Raw. Usually puts me out like a light within 30 seconds, but that's me. I can't say that I've drifted off into a slumber wondering about the Intercontinental title, but in this case, Oliver was was doing just that. He says, as I understand it, the IC strap can only change hands when it is defended on the North American continent as opposed to anywhere in the world, which is covered by the world title. Now here's my question. Doesn't this clause render the IC title change at SummerSlam 92 null and void since it happened uh, in Europe? I know that Vince thinks he can fool everyone, but that's not my concern really, only whether my interpretation of the IC title is correct. Uh, I don't know what orifice Oliver pulled that out from, I have never heard that before in my life, that the intercontinental title could only change hands on uh, North American soil. That's news to me. I mean, the title by that point had been around for a number of years. I don't know anybody who's ever interpreted the rule that way. But these are the things that Oliver thinks about when he goes to bed at night. Bob Russ Basan, or Russ Basin, however you pronounce this guy's name, I'm sure he won't mind. He responds, the word intercontinental is about as devoid of meaning as possible when applied to a championship. Uh, there is no reasonable interpretation of the word in this context. If it were the continental or intracontinental title, then it could possibly mean North American championship, but that is not its name. Besides that, it has often been defended outside of North America. In fact, according to the WWF, the first champion, Pat Patterson, he wonders, won the title in a tournament in South America. And that is correct. In fact, it was Rio de Janeiro. See, Kayfabe was still alive and well in 1992. Russ was, uh, what's his name, Bob? Not Russ, Bob. Russ Bassan, that was his last name. Bob is keeping Kayfabe alive in 1992. Intercontinental in the real world means across continents. If you take an intercontinental flight, you fly from one continent to the other. It is current. It is certainly a bizarre word with which to label a belt. The name is confusing and it is no more restrictive than world title 
The only reason for giving it such a weird name that I can see is that the WWF wanted a second world championship that was not as prestigious as the first, and they did not think lesser world title had a good ring to it. The Candy Guru. Not one to want to miss out on the conversation. The Candy Guru chimes in. Yes, Patterson won the title, if I recall correctly, in Rio. But the whole idea of the title was that the WWF would have a secondary champion, and Hogan did not really have a heavy defense schedule during his first reign until he began his feud with Paul Orndorff. So therefore, when Hogan was not on the card, you could put Morocco, Santana, Valentine, or Savage on the card, say there is a defense, and poof, there is your draw. Maybe not as big of a draw as Hogan, but they did get a title defense all the same. These days, the IC title is reserved for the guy who can work the best match, although Piper would be an exception to that rule. If my theory is correct, I think Ric Flair would be a candidate for the IC title as well. Well, it took 13 more years, but eventually Ric Flair did in fact become the Intercontinental Champion, so the candy guru was right. She was just off by a decade plus, or he. I don't know if it's a she or not. I see Candy Guru. I think Candy, I think female. It could be a guy. Maybe he just likes candy. It is RSPW after all. I'm sure they liked uh, a lot of their candy. Back in the 80s, all the wrestlers liked their candy. The only thing is they took their candy up the nose. That's a different kind of candy. Some people like cotton candy. Some people like candy corn. WWF wrestlers liked uh, a little bit of the nose candy. Back in the 80s. That's just how they roll. Two years later, our friend Oliver was back with a thread titled WWF House Show Review June 24th. This was posted on June 27, 1994. The WWF came to town last Friday. The results are nothing shocking, but I will run down some of the stuff anyway. Me, my girlfriend, RSPW lurker Patrick Kalman, and three of his friends were in attendance. What I was looking forward to the most was seeing the Quebecers in their home province. We have fourth row ringside seats. Overall, I was unimpressed, but the row of mutants in front of us made up for it. Car took place across the river from Ottawa in Hull, Quebec. One mutant looked just like Ole Anderson, except he was about five feet tall and had a weird limp. He was fun because by the end of the show, he was countering all of our pro-heel chants with his own pro-babyface chants. He also cracked a lot of bad jokes throughout the entire show. Then there was a woman, a rare sight at a wrestling show, I'm sure, who turned around and said, Fuck you! After we would yell something or start up a chant, by the middle of the show, she had expanded it to Fuck you, man! I think this was all the English that she could speak during a chant of kill the ref for not allowing uh, something or other. I cut it off here. She was also pretty upset at one point during the Heart vs. Heart main event when it looked like Owen would win and we were really cheering him on. Then there was the mutant who had to look away several times during the main event whenever a painful move was executed. I'm sure what I got was just a taste of the mutants in... Boy, he sure loves using that word, huh? Because I'm sure uh, what I got was a taste of the mutants in Philly and Texas. Oh yes, there were some matches too. Most of them sucked, but seeing them live and getting to yell at Lex Luger was entertainment enough. It says, uh, Lundra Blaze pinned Luna Vachon. Unfortunately, the French crowd did not make the Vachon family connection, so Luna was booed. Or, you know, she was just the fucking heel. Could just be that. Lex Luger pinned Crush with a schoolboy in what was the slowest match I've ever seen. The idiot crowd even chanted, USA, which we countered with, Yankee, go home. The Quebecers beat the Head Shrinkers in a non-title match when Jacques small packaged a shrinker. Quebecers were faces and the Shrinkers were heels. Not as hot of a match as I expected. Jeff Jarrett pinned Doink with a roll-up. Yokozuna pinned Typhoon with a leg drop. I could not resist shouting out, Let's go, Shockmaster! In the main event, Bret Hart pinned Owen Hart with a roll-up. 
very slow match with no high spots. If you have not been to a house show in a while, you should go just to participate in berating the baby faces. Oliver thinks he's really cool, you see, because he goes to the shows to be contrarian, he's gonna boo all the baby faces and cheer all the heels, and he's gonna chant kill the ref, because he's so cool! Oliver is just the coolest guy in the room. He's too cool for school. He's gonna anger, he's gonna go to the show to anger all the mutants. He used that word about 15 times here in his post. Talk about all the mutants, as he calls them, who paid to be there. Guarantee you Oliver's never spoken to a woman before without having to give his credit card number. We skip to Valentine's Day, 1998. Another day, I'm sure that uh, Oliver has never celebrated before. And a post by Ripclaw. Ripclaw is a regular of the RSPW crew. I know it's been a while since we did the last installment, but he pops up a lot here on the... on the, sh on the, on the show, on the segment. You might hear his name mentioned a few times. He was very active in the forum. And a post here titled, I'm going to stick up for Louis Spicoli. This is a name you don't really hear too much about these days, but... Louis Spicoli was a talented young guy. He had a lot of friends in the business, and was not officially a member of the clique, but I, I think he was friendly with those guys and had the Rad Radford run in WWE, and then he was doing some stuff in WCW, which is when this post was created. Said that there was an item by Bob Ryder the other day, Spicoli in hot water, which said Louis Spicoli is reportedly in hot water for a remark he made while commentating on Thunder this week. Spicoli responded to a remark from Tony Schiavone by saying, You shouldn't say bombshell in a place like Oklahoma City. The remark was offensive, given the tragic bombing that happened in Oklahoma City just two years ago and prompted an angry reaction from callers to TBS on Friday. Ripclaw asks, Why isn't Tony Schiavone getting in hot water? I would think him saying bombshell first would be offensive, since the Nimrods called TBS anyway against Louie. J.C. Gilbert replies, I'm in complete agreement here. Louie was trying to protect Shivani in this case and could have, for the sake of the hopelessly ignorant, cited the reason why the word bombshell should not be used in Oklahoma City. Whoever says Louie is in hot water is probably figuring that Tony is politically protected and Louie is not. And we'll never know how much hot water Louis Spicoli may have gotten himself into because the very next day, Louis Spicoli died. And he was only 27 years old when he passed away. Danger 3210, with a post on June 10th, 1999, mere weeks before we saw the first Millennium Countdown on WWE television. I remember watching Raw. And seeing this Millennium Countdown, and I knew, I knew, all my friends knew, we knew right away what this was for. And we all got very excited, because we knew that Chris Jericho was coming over to the WWF. He was no longer going to be wasting, wasting away in WCW, toiling away, being jobbed out, which is what they were doing with him there at the end. We all saw a star written all over him. It was only a matter of time before he made his way over. The headline of the post is Chris Jericho's rumored WWF name, Oh Boy. And we know from recent years, the name that you get in WWE can make you, it can break you, it could ruin careers. Need I remind you of some of the worst names out of developmental many years ago? Names like Eli Cottonwood and Percy Watson and countless others. And, and many names, thankfully, that were averted that people were uh, supposed to get, but then were able to talk themselves out of it. The name is very important. Here's the post. Excalibur. There's a name you might recognize. Excalibur. Says maybe Jericho should stay in WCW after all. What is he gonna do, fight with a sword? Well, remember Paul White's rumored name, Titan. Hopefully this rumor like that one will not become the truth. So how do you like that? Jericho almost became Excalibur. And now he gets to uh, work alongside Excalibur every week on Dynamite. 
Excalibur, I, I see a lot of divided opinion about Excalibur when it comes to his commentary on AEW every week. Excalibur doesn't bother me the way that certain other announcers do. Uh, I, I wouldn't consider him to be the best play-by-play -play guy that is on wrestling tell Not by any means. He's not the best, but he's kind of in the middle for me. But I have to say, you know, when it comes to Excalibur and the way he uh, calls certain moves on TV, <laughs> the way he enunciates certain moves, though, drives me up a wall. You know, he's calling the dives every week on TV, but then he'll call like a pile driver, right? Now, if, if you or I were calling a pile driver in a match, you would call it a pile driver. Or maybe if you were going to really kind of enunciate it, you would say, you know, pile driver or some, something like that, right? But the way he, the way that he says it, when he shouts it out, it's like, pile driver! I'm like, that's not how you say it. It's not pile driver. It's pile driver. It's the, it's the Tombstone Pile Driver. It is not the Tombstone Pile Driver! That is incorrect. That is the thing about Excalibur that bugs the shit out of me every week. It is not a Pile Driver. A Pile Driver. He's sleeping with his girlfriend. You're not giving her a Pile Driver! You're giving her a Pile Driver. Anyway, Buzzkill, how do I even talk? I'm gonna start talking about AEW and Excalibur. Buzzkill says Titan would be a thousand times better than The Big Show. I don't know where the Titan thing came from. Uh, I've seen that rumor as well before, and I, you know, I saw it a few times here. I, I think it may have just been something, honestly, that was totally made up. Just totally fabricated out of thing. I mean, for all we know, it could have started right here. It could have started right here on RSPW. Uh, I never, I never really knew where that came from. I do remember reading at the time, though, uh, after Big Show debuted in WWE, that originally he was going to be called the Big Nasty. Instead of the Big Show Paul White, he was going to be the Big Nasty Paul White. And from what I understand, I think that also has been uh, debunked. I think that was also uh, nonsense. Because I always thought to myself, like, if he's going to be the Big Nasty, right? Because they would send Big Show out, just like all the other main eventers, they would send them out to do media. And I was just trying to like picture this, where you have this like TV news anchor or the news host who's about to interview Paul White, and, and you know they call him the Big Show. But imagine if he was the Big Nasty, and they're doing a news segment. And coming up next, we're gonna talk to the Big Nasty, or like Mr. Nasty. How ridiculous! How stupid that sounds. So thankfully, that uh, I think was just complete BS. I don't I don't really think that uh, was ever considered by WWE, but over the years, it's like the Macho Man stuff. It took a lot, it took a long time, but eventually people found the old message board post on some internet forum where it appears the whole Macho Man Stephanie thing kind of came from. And that was always, my thought is, it probably just originated on some message board somewhere. Many years later, we found, you know, the post that probably is what uh, started it back in, like, I think it was like a post from 2004 or 2003 or something like that. But that's how these things get started. One random comment on RSPW or on an internet message board, and all of a sudden it just takes on a life of its own. The big Nasty. I actually don't think Titan would have been a bad choice. If he was coming up in WWE in, like, the 80s or something, I think Titan would have been a pretty cool name. Then we have uh, Hogan Aside, I guess is how you pronounce it. That's this person's name. It's spelled like suicide or homicide. He spells it Hogan Aside, but uh, on September 8th here, 1999, with a post titled, What If Jeff Jarrett Started Randomly Guitar Shotting Young Children from the Audience? What if indeed? If Jeff Jarrett started randomly guitar shotting young kids from the audience, would that be enough to get him some heat? I mean, he could come out to his hillbilly theme music like normal, walking down the ramp and then all of a sudden just nail a four-year-old boy from the audience with his guitar. Because I don't think smacking around female wrestlers and old broads is going to be enough. Uh, Poison Arrow says, sadly, it probably would take something like that for Jarrett to get any kind of consistent heat without Deborah around. He might not get much heat in the WWF, but he sure seems to get it in here. 
fecal matter. As you can tell, we've come to the classy portion now of RSPW. Fecal matter says he couldn't get heat if he went on the muscular dystrophy telethon and gave Jerry's kids chair shots to the head. Do they have those MDA telethons anymore? I don't think they do. I think when Jerry, I think when Jerry Lewis went away, so did the uh, telethons. Maybe somebody else took it over. Maybe Ryan Seacrest took it over, like he takes over everything else. Took over the New Year's Eve thing from Dick Clark. Maybe he took that over too. Danger thirty two. You want to know why so many people are unemployed right now? It's because Ryan Seacrest got all the fucking jobs. <laughs> this guy's everywhere. Danger thirty two ten is back with another post on July 26, 1999, titled, So why exactly is Austin killing Jeff Jarrett? This was the night after the fully loaded pay-per-view, by the way, in 99. That's where they had the first blood match between Stone Cold and The Undertaker, which I think is probably the best match those two ever had. Some people might say SummerSlam 98 or... I, I think that this is my favorite of the matches that Austin and The Undertaker had. This was the one that had the stipulation where if uh, Austin won, Vince McMahon would be forced to leave W... <laughs> he would be forced to leave. Oh my god. <clears throat> I can't say that with a straight face. Oh. He would be forced to leave. <laughs> I mean, here we are all these years later and just comical the idea of him leaving at all. It's just, it's just farcical. It's just, it's nonsense. It's ridiculous. But that was the stipulation. And of course, Austin won. So they had Vince McMahon leave. And then a month later, he was back. It says, are they setting up a feud or not? I expected after X-Pac ran in during the main event that Jarrett would do the same and give Austin a guitar, a guitar shot. That never happened. So what is the purpose of all these stunners on Double J? I hope this leads to something. Rudy Poo responds seems to me they are setting up austin and deborah as a couple on tv or maybe they just want jarrett to get into main events they are spending so much time on him matt dooley says hopefully double j will call him out tonight i've been expecting it to happen for a long time the angle looks like stone cold totally overlooks jarrett jarrett gets pissed off and challenges austin austin says something like look kid you're way out of your league here couple of guitar shots later, we've got a real feud. Oh, the naive WWE fans of that time. Thinking there was going to be a main event feud between Stone Cold and Jeff Jarrett. Now that's funny. That's funny. Smarfish has a bit of a different take. This is leading nowhere other than to satiate the enormous ego of Steve Austin. His random stunners on Jeff Jarrett are just a way for him to one up the dude that hangs out on camera with his woman. Besides, Jeff Jarrett is a nobody. As a face, as a heel, or whatever, he's lucky they gave him Deborah because without her, he can't get over in any way. He is in the same league with Billy Gunn. As far as that goes, even a wizard like McMahon can't do anything for these losers. Hopeless. Look, like I said, it, it, I find it very amusing that there were a lot of people who thought that they were setting up for something with Steve Austin and Jeff Jarrett. And the whole don't piss me off run that he had there in 99, that probably was, I mean, I guess he became WCW champion, but at least in WWE, that really was, I feel like, the peak of Jarrett, where if you wanted to maybe try to elevate him, you could have tried. It would have failed, but you could have tried. But, you know, I, I, I mean, I guess I can't blame people. They were kind of teasing it on TV. So, I mean, you would think that it was going to go somewhere. It was going to go to a match, maybe not a pay-per-view program, but maybe a match on TV or something. But uh, it is amusing, though, now with the benefit of, of hindsight and all that we know from comments that have been made, interviews with, Jim Ross and Jim Cornette and people who were working for the company and who were around during that period of time, knowing what we now know about how Austin felt about Jeff Jarrett. 
there was no chance in hell that he was going to work any kind of program with Jeff Jarrett. From the uh, from the low payoffs that, you know, Jarrett and his father were paying out to Austin and other people when he worked down in Memphis, and the work shoot that he did when uh, Austin... Remember, Austin was doing the whole Austin 316 thing. When Jarrett came back to the company in 97, he cut that work shoot on TV. Totally blindsided Austin when he went out there and talked about how blasphemous it was. And Austin was pissed. I mean, I think he was waiting for him when he came through the curtain in the back. He was not happy. So Austin had a lot of reasons to not be very uh, happy with Jeff Jarrett. And also just the fact that Jeff Jarrett was never near, not even in the stratosphere of the level of star that Stone Cold was at that time. Wasn't even close. Even when he was on top in TNA, wasn't even comparable. So the idea that they would work a program together... I mean, I know Rock worked one with Billy Gunn. They tried going into SummerSlam that year. But it's laughable. There's also the story of Bruce Pritchard telling uh, that he tells. I think he told it once on Ric Flair's old podcast about Austin. He was getting a paycheck once so small when he was working in the USWA. He literally is standing in the back, staring at the check, because he is so shocked by how low it is and supposedly Jeff Jarrett walks by and he slaps him on the shoulder and he makes the comment to him he says keep staring at it boy it ain't gonna make it any bigger and he walked off Austin never forgot that that that's not something you forget that's something that just sticks in your craw so I am sure that when he was pitch the idea or, you know, he thought that they might come to him with the idea about working with Jarrett, he shot that shit down real quick. I can't say that I blame him. Then we have the big crapper. Boy, we got some real winners this week, right? We got we got uh, Oliver who loves to go to the events and heckle and make fun of people. We've got fecal matter. There was another person, trailer trash. Now we have the big crapper. We really, we hit the jackpot this week with all these different RSPW users. The Big Crapper with one of the dumbest thread titles that I have ever seen from February 18th, 2000, which turned out to be one of the best years that WWE ever had on pay-per-view. So I want you to, and I don't just mean in terms of buy rates, I mean in terms of, of the quality of the show. So I want you to keep that in mind when you consider that the headline on his post is WWF scrap your pay-per-views now here's the post they are honestly ruining the way your business runs over the last 10 years the WWF has run its business the same way they build their shows around their pay-per-views all their big matches happen at the pay-per-views it seems tonight for example Triple H is set to battle Kane for the WWF title, but everybody knows that Kane will not win because Triple H is set to battle Cactus Jack for the title in No Way Out. If Kane did happen to win the belt, everybody knows he would just lose it right back to Triple H before No Way Out. The biggest problem with this is that it's like this with everybody. We know Jericho won't lose his belt and neither will the New Age Outlaws. As soon as they announce the matches for the next show, everyone with those belts is a lock to have them. Well, first of all, that is not true. <laughs> there have been instances before. I didn't make a list, but I've watched this long enough to know that there have been exceptions to that. Generally, that is correct, but that is not exactly 100% uh, fact. Anyway, uh, th the rest of this post here is not even worth getting into. So if the Big Crapper had his way, basically if the Big Crapper had the power in WWE at that time, WWE would have junked all of its pay-per-views and just given away every match on free TV. Every match would have been given away on USA Network. There would be no pay-per-views. Even though the very existence of Raw and SmackDown they are commercials for your pay-per-views. That's, that's really the only purpose that those shows serve. Superstars, Wrestling Challenge, Raw, SmackDown. They are advertisements to get you hyped up for the pay-per-view. That is how wrestling has worked now for many, many, many years. 
And back during this period in 99, or 2000, I guess it was, it was working out pretty well for WWE. They were making quite a bit of money off their pay-per-views back then, as compared to what they would be making only a few years later. Maybe if the big crapper had made this comment 10 years later, I would have felt a little bit differently. But for him to make the comment in 2000, of all the years, of all the time for him to make a stupid comment like that, I, I could only just shake my head. If the crapper had his way, WWE, you know, at that time, junking all of their pay-per-views, WCW would have won the war. If this guy had his way. Unreal. Next, we have Owen Aardvark with a post on March 8th, 1999 titled Rodney and Pete Gas coming to the WWF. Who doesn't see this one coming? The two spoiled rich guys who come in a wrestle gimmick Maybe an old gimmick, but it's still good to watch as the rich guys get their asses handed to them. Remember, you heard it from me first. I don't know. I guess that means that this is probably right when Rodney and Pete Gas came in. So I guess he's predicting that they would go on to wrestle. I guess is that what he's saying here? RSPW Poster. Very original name. Says, these two guys look like they've been enjoying a little too much of that Greenwich cuisine. No wonder they call him Pete Gas. Is every guy from Greenwich, Connecticut a bloated vanilla ice wannabe? Charlie Potch may need to get his eyes checked with this comment here. Is it just me or does Rodney look and act exactly like Shawn Michaels? Hmm. Did Shawn Michaels ever put streaks in his hair? Did he ever put highlights in his hair that that were that noticeable on TV? Did he ever frost his hair? Do you have any recollection of Shawn Michaels ever doing anything like that or having hair even remotely looking like Rodney of the Mean Street Posse? Because I don't. If you do, then I'd love to see the screenshot. Screenshot it and tweet it to me because I would love to see it. Or, or did he wear that sweater vest to the ring like Rodney used to do when he was part of the posse? Yeah, Rod Rodney looked like Shawn Michaels. Rodney looked like Shawn Michaels the way that I look like Clark Kent. And P yeah, Cl actually. I'll show, I'll show you my Clark Kent look here. I don't wear these when I'm on cat. I, I don't wear these really hardly ever, but... There. There we go. There's Clark Kent. Clark Kent Monster. There you go. Yeah. Don't I look like Shawn Michaels? Oh, come on, man. I look just like I look just like Shawn Michaels. Right? Come on. Char Charlie thinks I look just like HBK. Look at this. You can get all the ladies. If anybody can get me Charlie's address, I'll mail these to him free of charge. I think he needs a pair. asinine comment to make. And PH says, I would mark if this happened, because remember this, those guys are really Shane's old college buddies, from what I hear. I think they have done a great job so far. I love the Mean Street Posse. I was very, very, very entertained by them when they debuted from the Mean Streets of Greenwich, the music, the vests, I, I love I love the posse. They were part of some of the most entertaining segments in 99. And finally, April 19th, 2000. Captain Dan wants to know, why is Pete Gas called Pete Gas? This is the age-old question. Why, why is Pete Gas called Pete Gas? Well... Skull Captain of Glorious La Parca, King of RSPW with Baby Doll and Muffy, says, <laughs> let me repeat that. Let me repeat this person's username. Skull Captain of Glorious La Parca, King of RSPW with Baby Doll and Muffy, says, maybe he has terrible flatulence. That may be 
you know, I mentioned earlier the longest username I've ever seen. I think we just topped it here. This I, Two in one day. I think he just topped it. But anyway, Skull Captain of Glorious Laparka, King of RSPW with Baby Doll and Muffy. I think he's got the right idea. Maybe he just has a really bad flatulence bar. <laughs> I mean, isn't that the most obvious answer to give? The guy has a gas problem. He was probably bullied in school. People called him, you know, Pete Gas, and they probably gave him the atomic wedgie and all that. Poor guy. So, anyway, that's what he thinks. That's his theory. Two Middle Fingers says because he used to work at a gas station. Perfectly sensible explanation. There's another one. Right? Take your take your pick. Either he had a really bad flatulence problem or he worked at a gas station. Stern fan, though, he uh, injects some reality into the conversation. He says, as far as I know, it is his real name. And indeed, Stern fan is correct. Actually, his name is Gasparino. So that is where Pete Gas comes from. Pete Gasparino was shortened to Pete Gas. Although that does not mean that he does not have a flatulence problem or that he did not one day work at a gas station. All three of those things can be true. It could be his real name, he could have a gas problem, and he could have worked at a gas station. All three of those things could very well be accurate. So when we start talking about gas stations and flatulence, that is when I know it is time to bring this party to a close. I hope you enjoyed this installment. It also helped me decide what I'm having for dinner tonight. I'm having a hot dog. Subscribe for more rewinds in the future and all the other fun stuff we've got on the channel. Comment below. Let me know what you thought. Let me know if there's any subjects. If you used to be on RSPW many years ago, if you have vague memories of posts of certain subjects, if there's certain subjects you want me to try to look up, let me know. And you might just hear about it on the next edition of the Rewind. And leave a like before you leave as well. And with that, I will see you next time for another trip back in time to the Funny Farm. Until then.